Hello, and this presentation is called Can We Explain Matrilineal Descent? Evolutionary Hypotheses and Proposals. So let's start with what we're not proposing when we're proposing an evolutionary explanation of matrilineal descent. We're not proposing a gene for matrilineal descent. So we're not saying that some human populations have a matrilineal gene and others a patrilineal gene, and this explains a difference in behavior. In other words, we're not attributing it to a genetic difference. And that's very unlikely for reasons that anthropologists have long been aware of. So two arguments against the gene float forward approach have been made. And one is the observation that human societies change their kinship systems quite rapidly. And we can see very rapid social change and kinship systems alter in the matter of decades. And second, descent systems have a very curious uh, geography to them. So when we look at their geographical distribution, it's rather puzzling if we were to take that gene for approach. So here's an example. The Opsaluka or Crow people who lived in Montana spoke a language that belongs to the family of languages called Siouan. And the Omaha people in Nebraska also spoke a Siouan language. So they're both Siouan peoples, and the historical distance between them is probably just a couple thousand years. Um, but despite this, they have very different kinship systems. The Crow are the exemplar of a matrilineal society with what's called a Crow kinship terminology that's very distinctive. And the Omaha are the exemplar of a patrilineal society with an Omaha type kin terminology that's equally distinctive. So they have very different kinship systems despite being closely related. So that's puzzling, but even more puzzling, the people called the Trobriand Islanders, and they live to the northeast of Australia in Melanesia, out in the Pacific Ocean. But they have a crow kin system. Their terminological system, as well as their descent systems, are very similar to the crow. While the Maasai of East Africa have an Omaha system. And there's tens of thousands of years historically between the Maasai and the Omaha, yet their system is very similar to the Omaha. So how do we explain this puzzling geography? And this is a picture of some Omaha scouts in the 19th century when they were serving for the U.S. military. And this is a fairly contemporary photo of some young Maasai men in probably Kenya. So the question is, why are these geographically separated people so similar, while peoples who are much closer are quite different? Now, for many decades, anthropologists argued that observations like this rule genes out of the picture entirely, and it turns out that's not true. So the error was the way that genes were being thought about. And it's become recognized that genes can and do generate behavioral variation. So the genes don't necessarily generate a single behavioral pattern but rather genes can influence a range of behaviors in different ecological context. So what we're saying here is that the Maasai and the Omaha, the Crow and the Trobrianders could all be genetically identical at the genetic lo loci that are influencing their kinship behaviors. So the same genes can generate different behaviors in different environmental contexts and when this happens, it's called a facultative response. And this has become a very important concept in studies of animal behavior as well as human behavior. So we come back to why matrilineal descent. Can we make an adaptive argument about it? 
And in fact, several adaptive arguments have been proposed. The first was Richard Alexander's paternity confidence hypothesis uh, back in the early 1970s. And if we think about the example of the Maso, there's good reason to think that Maso men have low paternity confidence. So how might this be related to matrilineal descent? Well, Alexander's pointed out that while so we may have some doubt who our fathers are, but we're quite certain who our mothers are. So the idea here is that men will focus on their sister's children if they doubt paternity of their own children. And this takes us back to inclusive fitness and the observation that two nieces are equivalent to one daughter from the perspective of our genes. So in this view, matrilineal descent is an adaptive response to uncertain paternity. Now, what might lower paternity certainty? Well, certainly the Maso pattern of courtship would do that. Um, but residence patterns also seem to be important. And one residence pattern called matrilocal residence, where the husband joins the wife, plus her mother and sisters, seems particularly closely related to low paternity confidence. So why might then matrilocal residents lower paternity confidence? We kind of just have to keep asking the next question and the next question. And here uh, there's a couple of reasons. One is that anthropologists have observed that in matrilocal societies, women have considerably more social status and more autonomy and this also translates into greater sexual freedom. The second reason is that given the matrilocal residence pattern, the men around are unrelated to one another. So there's higher likelihood that your spouse or partner might be having sex with another man. There's also a higher likelihood that that man won't be a relative and inclusive fitness won't do anything to balance out that relation. So a facultative solution in this circumstance that would be adaptive could be the avunculate in matrilineal descent where the man shifts his investment into his sister's children rather than into his own children. Now one criticism of this is that it's an androcentric argument and that means that it's male biased. We're making up the adaptive argument based on male interest. And that's true. Um, but at the same time, we can actually explore other hypotheses that dovetail with this androcentric argument. And one of these goes back to, to grandmothers. So there's a Maso matriarch. And as you will recall, the grandmother hypothesis points out that particularly maternal grandmothers may increase the survival of their grandchildren. And of course, having your aunts and sisters around to help is a great benefit too. And so this is good from a female perspective and it somewhat makes us wonder why it isn't more common in the world. Less than 20% of traditional societies had matrilineal descent systems. But then we can push the question to another level and say, okay, matrilocal residents might produce low paternity certainty, but why would this occur? Uh, one argument has been based on subsistence patterns. And this is the observation that most matrilineal peoples are gardeners like the Yanomamo. They're horticulturalist. However, as you'll learn, the Yanomamo don't appear to be matrilineal. And this leads to the counter observation that the reverse doesn't hold. Although most matrilineal people are horticulturalists, most horticulturalists are not matrilineal. Instead, the majority are patrilineal. So this is a problematic association in that way. Another argument that's been made is that where matrilocal residence is common, the males are often absent. They're away in trade or warfare. And supporting this is the observation that matrilineal societies are definitely not pacific. And this means that they're often engaged in very active warfare with surrounding societies. Uh, this somewhat throws a damper on our hopes that women having more political influence would lead to less, less warfare. 
So a more recent hypothesis that's been proposed is based on daughter biased investment. The logic on this is a little cloudy when applied to matrilineal descent because the bias isn't towards daughters except on the part of the mother. And so we have to explain before we explain the daughter biased investment why in matrilineal systems women have more control over property. And that's a rather different argument. In many matrilineal systems, in fact, it's the uncle, uh, the mother's brother, who has control of the property. And in that case, he's not investing in a daughter. He's investing in a niece. But in any case, this hypothesis, the daughter-biased investment hypothesis, gets us to wondering and exploring under what circumstances it makes sense to focus wealth and inheritance on women. And that's an important question to explore. So again, to reiterate, what is not being proposed is that some human populations have a matrilineal gene, while others have a patrilineal gene. That's not the evolutionary argument. And you'll note that none of the hypotheses that we've discussed require that kind of an argument. Instead, we're arguing for facultative behavior and we're trying to define under what certain circumstances matrilineal systems might arise and under what circumstances other kinship systems might arise. Now, given the variation, one response might be that this is all just culture and we don't really need to look for adaptive evolutionary arguments. And that might be true. But what if there is a discoverable adaptive logic to matrilineal, patrilineal, and bilateral affiliation? What if we can find an adaptive logic to these different kinship systems? And what if those kinds of kinship systems recur cross-culturally in similar social and behavioral ecologies? And lastly, what if the behaviors change? What if kinship systems are altered as ecologies change? And what if they track ecological changes in an adaptive manner? And all of this would lead us to think that it isn't just culture. All of these arguments, each individually and all three together, suggest an evolved behavioral adaptation is at work and that an ultimate explanation is possible. So let's summarize now with the helicopter professor. What are two arguments against there being a gene for matrilineal descent? And really what we're saying are what are two arguments against genetic differences accounting for matrilineal and patrilineal systems? What is a facultative response? What do we mean by that? What did Richard Alexander propose that might explain matrilineal descent? What are three reasons why arbitrary culture theory is inadequate? And that's all. Thank you for listening.